Afternoon all, I hope you're well. Thursday afternoon, I'm just heading into town to St. James's. I'm gonna be heading into JJ Fox's to meet up with Shimshon. Uh, some of you may know him from YouTube. He's popped in on some of my lives, um, but he's more active, I think, on Facebook. Um, lives in Israel and he's on here, he's here in the UK on a visit. And uh, we agreed to meet up at uh, JJ Fox's. Um, I should be there in a few minutes, so looking forward to that. Just driving up Park Lane now, you've got Aston Martin here on the left. You've got all the flash uh, car companies, well, not all, but some. Um, very high end part of London. On the right hand side, there's a winter wonderland every year. <coughs> and I can see it's in full swing during the uh, winter holidays. Uh, we went there, I'm not sure if it was last year, but the year before possibly. I'm not sure even if it was open last year. Uh, so it must have been a couple of years ago at least. It was not bad, it was interesting. Um, but uh, not so sure that I'd rush to go back. But uh, it's nice, it's always nice to go out, but um, it didn't tickle my fancy at the time, I seem to recall. But anyway, that's there. Hyde Park Hotel just gone past. I think this is, is it the hill from Park Lane. I think so. Anyway, catch you soon. Sat nav's taking me on some winding back streets here. And we're coming on to Piccadilly. a one-way street, my dear. What are you staring at, man? It's a one-way street. amazed at how much building is going on in town. I was, uh, I just look at the structure there. You've got the whole facade is still there, but the rest of the building's been removed. Pretty awesome how they do that. And yeah, in town, in the West End, that's pretty much the only way to develop property. If you've got an existing property, if it's of any kind of age, you know, it's, protect, it's protected by, uh, uh, it's usually got listed status, um, and you can't, uh, you can't remove uh, the facade because um, it ruins the character of, uh, of the region. But it's ever evolving. on the right-hand side and then it'll be St. James's. Got St. James's just there on the right. I'm looking out now for Shimshon. I'm looking for a long ginger beard. If you see one, shout, because that'll be Shimshon. They're not that common, long ginger beards, so you should stick out like a sore thumb. He may well be inside already. St. James's. Finding some parking is always a challenge. Got David off here on the right. Haven't been in there for yonks. JJ Fox Humidor, and we're going to hear something about some cigars. I forget your first name. George. George, right. That's the one. Fritz, yeah? That's the one. Yeah. Fantastic. 
Yeah, here you have the Portler and Yogurt Galantis. Oh, I've heard about this. Which have you had them? The newest, yeah, I have actually. It's and? the newest Laren Yogurt. It's a little more forward than the Petite Corona, more forward than the Nakagoras, as in more olive tones, more leather, it's less of those open green notes. But it's equally as salty as so sweet. Okay. Yeah, it's fantastic. A great price. Was it 22 quid? Uh, 23, yeah. 23. 23. Okay, we'll bear that in mind. Yeah. So that's the latest thing that's come out, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so all right, I'll, I'll see how we go. I'm going to have a pipe first and then fantastic, we'll man. see how we go. All right, cheers. Okay, so I'm here with Simpson, finally. The day has arrived. And uh, we're going to enjoy some pipes and tobacco. We hope so. Shimshon has uh, given me very kindly a tin of GLP's Westminster 2019. It's cool, it's a major one. And uh, I've brought a selection of tobaccos here. So we have some Rena Gold, which is similar but not the same as all the Golden Slurs. Um, it's a, like a long, stringy flake. Okay. Uh, Watch City Simply Red, which is the Red Virginias. And this is GQ Ask Asquith mixture. Have you ever had that? I don't think so. Okay, so in the, in the days before Sam Brammer, who currently owns mm -hmm. um, GQ Tobaccos, um, you used to be able to mix tobaccos. You used to be able to do sort of uh, tobacconists were allowed to have house blends. Yeah. Nowadays it's illegal. You can't mix your own. Wow. So any house blend that you get in an in a English tobacconist is actually going to be Gareth Hogarth or Samuel Gareth or okay. anything else that they've rebadged. Um, so, the guy who used to own GQ Tobaccos beforehand was Glyn Quelch, his name was. Okay. And he was a wizard with uh, mixing up tobaccos. He, he was a blender. And um, so he had a, a handful of blends, I don't know, maybe eight or ten blends, which he had. That's and he impressive. Used to, yeah, and, and that was on his website, and people loved them. So one of them was Asquith Mixture. Now, there is a loophole in that. Although you can't make your own blends, you can um, uh, you can. Uh, I'm all right, thanks. Water. Cold. Cold. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so what, what you can do is you can sell the ingredients as long as it's not blended. So I don't know if he's still doing it. I haven't actually bought any for a long time. Um, so he sends you a, like a kit form almost, yeah. a bag, and there's maybe four or five, whatever the ingredients are, in separate bags. You put them all together, give them a mix, stick them in a jar for a while, and that's it, you've got your blend. Uh, but Asquith was actually a cake. You bought it as a cake. So what I do is I bought the kit, and then I pressed it, and then stored it. So that's what this is. Fantastic. So that's Asquith. It's a vapor. Smell it, it's really, really cool. It's got a good chocolatey aroma. Um, I don't know how well that would, what's, have I put a date on it? 20. 2020, so it's been stewing for over a year. Wow, that's good stuff. Next one is some Marlin Flake, which is rat rays, um, and that's from 2002. That's good age. I don't know if you're into Virginias or not, but... <laughs> we'll see. It's, it's got a nice stewed fruit kind of aroma, that one. Next one is... Uh, Boswell's Northwoods, one of my favorites. I think you smoke this on a regular, regular basis. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. So that's a, that's a very nice, I would say, Balkan blend. It's, it's Balkan called, it's called Balkan. they call it English, but it's, English it's, Balkan, I know it's, yeah, it's, kind it's of basically, like, it's got Orientals in there, um, which gives it a little bit of a bulk. I think it's got, I'm not too sure. I've had a look at his website on the ingredients. Actually, it may not even have uh, more handles, I'm not sure. But it's very nice anyway. McBaron vanilla roll cake. I don't know if you've had that yet. I have not, but I've heard a lot of people talk about it. And the next one is a little bit of a treasure, which is McClelland fragrant matured cake. I'm nervous about trying anything with McClellan. Because <laughs> you won't be able to get it if you're not. Because I won't be able to get it. So, but man, that is great stuff. I am already going to try the vanilla roll cake. I know what's coming with that Good one. For you. I'm going to actually pinch a bit of your rainers. That and, um, where's my... Yeah. 
I think it's got, I'm not an expert in that one. I still need to smoke that. I got that recently. Um, actually came from a guy who was reducing his cellar. And he had it only, it wasn't, it was just bulk. He had a, a jar of it. Wow. And he sold the jar. Uh, so I've got, he sold it to me in a bag. Um, and I've got, I don't know, maybe three or four ounces of it. Um, so I'm also, I'm not dipping into it too often. Wow. Um, so just, so it's a bit of a, so yeah, it's a bit of a treat, so smoke it, you know, as every so often if you don't want it to go down too quickly. So I don't know how you do your coins. I generally will stack them and then fold them in half and put them on. More or less what I do, but I found a little trick. Sometimes when you do that, I find it's a little tricky to, uh, to get the pipe started. So I'll always save just a little bit here. And break it all up. And rub it out so it'll light better. Is that a Lestrade? Yeah, I need to put a filter in it right now. It's uh, the shape that I just got now, uh, Peterson Christmas yeah, Pipe 2021. It's, uh, I prefer peat lips, so that's the reason why I didn't get the Christmas Pipe. They don't do a peat lip? None of them are peat lips? No, no. The Christmas Pipe, there's no peat lips? None. Really? None. That's yeah. so odd. Have you noticed yeah. those, uh, those trucks? And if you notice, like on most, uh, on most uh, Sherlock's, They'll have an inlaid P, like the aluminum P that's in there, and yeah. these... They're rubbish, the Christmas it's, white one is rubbish, it's just the uh, white. So yeah, it's it's white filled, which is better than the hot stamp. It's better, yeah, but I, I had to, I couldn't get any, I could hardly draw any air through that. I had to do some, quite a bit of, did you see that video? No, I didn't, I need to look at it. I, was, I, was, I saw the video that you had when you were... Uh, I don't know if it's still up, it was a live video, I don't need the lives on for too long. Um, but basically, I had to straighten out the stem. Okay. You warm it up and straighten it, and I had to drill the mortise a little bit in okay. order to get air through with the filter in. Um, it wasn't. Good. I wasn't. Well, I wasn't happy, but I decided that I wanted to have the pipe, nevertheless. Yeah. So I did the the work, and it smokes fine now. Well, I think your the boreholes that you have in your pipes are usually quite a bit bigger than what most people that, that's one thing that's one part of it but the the problem was is the drilling the, the lestrade shape because it's got this long sort of stump mm -hmm. you know under, the underneath is long so this is the part that you that that's you the problem. Wow. yeah that's the issue okay so the filter is probably going past the hole isn't it if you where you put the filter i have no in, idea i've not looked yeah 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 it'll go so, past the hole yeah have you ever smoked that with a filter that pipe yeah you have and it smokes okay Smokes good enough for me. Fine. Yeah, good. No, just my one didn't. May, I mean, maybe it's a it, that's a difference. I don't know. Um, as you can tell, I've obviously smoked, smoked it without it, without the filter, but that's just because I didn't. I forgot to bring filters with me, but that's okay. Yeah, no, but it smokes fine now. Which which um, which uh, grade is that? It's a this is right. So this is uh, the standard uh, blast sandblast line yeah. of the Sherlock Holmes, and the, the I think the blast on it is as good as what you're going to get on a PSB. But the only difference is, which I like, it's got a bit of a naughty bit. Which yeah, is nice. no, that's to me that's the character of it. Yeah. I got this Rainer uh, stuff, uh, I can't remember exactly how long, maybe a year or so ago, and I've been dipping into it every so often just to see how it, how it ages, because right in the beginning when I got it, I wasn't a fan, mm -hmm. but You know what I appreciate about what you do? Exactly how I do. You see people, they'll only fill their bowl up to like right here. I, all the way to the top. So they're like, well, you burned your rim that way. So, well, it's my pipe. I've changed, and it I've changed my practice quite a bit. I used to only half fill the pipe. Mm -hmm. um, because I always found that the second half of the bowl, I didn't enjoy it. It was always ashy and whatever. Yep. And, um, and I would often tip it out. And I thought it was a bit of a waste. 
But now, I've, what I do instead is I gravity fill the pipe so it's so loose that by the time I've tamped it once or twice, it's already gone down quite a bit. Um, and I also smoke sometimes, you know, with smaller balls. This is one of my own, and it's quite a small ball. And it'll, you know, be a nice half hour smoke, and I prefer to have it more often, but less. Mm -hmm. Because I find that long balls, the second half is just never as good. Yeah. Occasionally, you'll get a tobacco which prefers to be the second half, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It, it tastes better in the second half, but it's quite rare. It's usually the first half. I did a couple of strange things back in the day where instead of taking the tobaccos and blending them together that uh, you put in there, sometimes I would load the, the bottom half of the bowl with one tobacco on the uh -huh. top with another. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would never be anything off from one to the other. Like they would both be English or an English and a Burley or a Cavendish and a Burley. Or whatever. Yeah, well, I mean it's tobacco, so it can't be too bad. Yeah, so you get some pretty interesting, uh, some pretty interesting things. I would never well, do something like a like a real heavy uh, aromatic on top of like an English or something like that. But uh, I would always do a lighter tobacco and then make it heavier as it goes down. So. Although um, aromatics sometimes go very well with that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So some the vanilla with the tequila goes very nice. Um, a lot of the crossover blends are exactly that. The vanilla with a bit of the tequila. Uh, yeah, it's hard to beat the vanilla in general. Hmm? I said, I think it's hard to beat vanilla flavor. Yeah, it's true. What business is this? What business is this? Business is this. Wow. I've tried all three versions of that uh, vanilla. So you've got the vanilla loose cuff, which is just the usual mixture type thing. Um, there's the roll cake, and you've got the flake. And the yeah, roll cake, so, uh, I find, not is interesting. It's quite, it's much more, shift, if I can use the word mature, uh, then the loose cuff, the loose cuff is uh, much more of a, an aromatic. The roll cake has <laughs> got a certain, um, maturity to it. It's like it's not just having a sweet in the sweet shop. There's a certain tobacco kind of flavour. There's a bit of a. I think there's a bit of Kentucky in there, possibly. There's something. There's a certain uh, there is savouriness to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I think balances it very well. And then you've got the flake cut, which I think goes a stage further. Um, I prefer the flake out of all of them. They're all good. But I definitely prefer the flake more than the others. More than the roll cake. Yeah. Wow, I thought you were saying that you like the roll cake better than the flake. I like the roll cake better. I actually like them all, and they each have their place because they are different. Depends yeah. how much you're going to sort of dissect it. But, yeah. Is it all the same blend, just processed different ways? I don't think so, no. I think the loose cut is more Cavendish based. It's a more, more of a classic aromatic. Um, the roll cut, the roll cake, um, I think is more Virginia. Um, I'm not sure if it's Kentucky or Burley, but I don't think there's that much Cavendish, if any at all, in, in the roll cake. And the flake cut is, I think, probably similar to the loose cut, but in a flake presentation. And there is definitely Cavendish in there. Um, if you have a look at the coloring of the roll cake, there's no black in there. There's some darker is there? spots, but yeah. Like it's gonna be minimal if there is. Yeah, okay, it'll be minimal if there is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very minimal. Um, well, I do notice a difference between them. Yeah, yeah. So I've been, uh, I told you, I've been smoking the uh, Germain's 1820 flake. Mm -hmm. And I've got, this is what's left of 50 grams that I bought and started smoking on Monday. Oh, you bought it here? So, yeah, because I can't get it where I'm at. So I got uh, Sam at G2, GQ to, uh, to send me some and then I just emailed him yesterday. I was like, I'm going to need 100 grams before this date. <laughs> so he's so sending you some more? Yeah, it's already in a post. May arrive today. So. Well, if you're going through it at that rate, you probably want more than 100 grams. Problem is, is I have other tobaccos I got too. I got a tin of um, special Latakia flake, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it's okay. I don't, I don't care because it's mostly Virginia, and I'm usually not a fan of Virginia. Oh, okay. 
So it's not what I was thinking. When I see Latakia, special Latakia flake, I'm thinking, oh, it's gonna, but I barely detect any in there, um, which is fine. And then I've got their, uh, in the States, it's called Royal Jersey Latakia mixture, which I think is just original Latakia mixture here. I've got that and that's good, but it's not as good as this. This is, that is quite close to Penzance. That's what people say. I've never had Penzance. I have Margate and... I'd be interested uh, to hear your feedback on Norfolk Scarlet. You think they're going to be kind of similar? Well, I was speaking about it this morning in my life today. And Penzance uh, and 1820 has a certain floral bouquet to it. It's got a certain... I, I assume it's Orientals. It's got a certain bouquet to it. I wouldn't call it Lakeland or anything like that. But it's got a certain herbal kind of flavor. Do you get that at all? So what I notice with it is there is something that I noticed with Margate, um, one or two GLPs that are heavy Latakia, and it's got like a, a funky smell to it, right? Okay. And it's like a like a, an off milk kind of like blue cheese. Yeah. Okay. So that that's the Orientals, and the in the in the Royal Jersey. The original Latakia, I can't take it because when I smoke it, I get heartburn. I don't know why, <laughs> but every time I smoke it, I get heartburn. It's just weird. And I've done the same thing on Saturday lunch. If anybody has chollen or something, I, just, <laughs> yeah. I get that with also with and so to bed. Um, so Isoterica and so to bed, I think are very much the same. It's very much the same as the Royal Jersey Latakia. Okay, that's my opinion. Um, and I, with both of them, I get hard work, wow. which is very odd. I don't get it with any other tobacco, but I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's got that certain sourness to it, which um, you can either like it or not. You know. It's, it's See, it's funny that you you say you give that uh, to Orientals versus like a Kia because I I always associate it with like a Kia because. Well, yeah, okay. one, a milky, kind of. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. yeah. I, I mean, I don't like when I when I smell this. Yeah, maybe it is the Orient. I mean, you'll know. But it's, yeah, so this is the Latakia. Right? So, so you in, in the aroma, it's Latakia. It's the smoky, sweet smokiness. Yeah, musty kind of smoke. Exactly, like funky, musty, like cellar cheese. Yeah, yeah. So that I get more in the tasting of Royal Jersey, mm. and so to that I get that cheesy, milky kind of uh, taste. Um, Were you lactose intolerant? <laughs> I don't think so. Look at the size of it. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're lactose intolerant. <laughs> So I struggle with those couple of blends, um, but in, in, in Northwoods there's also this kind of vegetable-y, herby, green tea kind of okay. taste to it, which right. I find yeah. it's not the same as 1820 or Penzance, but it's in that ballpark. Mm. And I was just saying today um, that it's, it's a, I've always sure, recommended right. it anyway in Northwoods, it's been one of my favorites for a long time. Right. And uh, people are always chasing these unicorn oh, blends, yes. and I was saying to simply Try Northwoods and see if you like it. It's plentiful, it's always available. The guy mixes it himself. Wow. And just go for that and enjoy it. You know, it's, it's, it's always, sometimes it's a little bit frustrating to try and get blends and you can't get them. How many uh, people out of uh, Pipe Club of London follow your channel? Uh, well, Pipe Club of London? Um, no idea. No idea? No, you, don't see, you don't see who subscribes to your, your channel? Yeah, but, uh, there's, mm. there's six, six and a half thousand subscribers. I'm not going to look through that. You don't know every single one of them? Of course. I, I've memorized them. Yeah. I've burned them into my quarter. You only remember yeah, the ones that comment every day and, and the, the, the three people that your, instantly uh, give you a thumbs your, down. Your face <laughs> changed right away. So you notice that as well. Yeah, it's funny because every time, no matter where I come in when you're doing your broadcast or whatever, no matter where I show up at, which is usually always, you know, either 45 minutes to two hours into your video, there's always at least like two or three thumbs down. It's the three people who I've either somehow I've had some kind of disagreement with, or they've, I mean, I've got, I don't like to, uh, certainly not gonna name anyone, but there's, there's definitely been for the last two or three years, the same, you know, there's, 
you know, you can speculate in your mind who it might be, but who cares? You know, first of all, you've got no way of knowing because it's anonymous. If I start worrying about that, then there's no point being in YouTube. I just think it's funny. It's, it's, it's like I'm tuning in to just a thumbs down your video. There's your new profile picture. Yeah. I mean, it is. <laughs> if that's what floats that boat, then good for that. That's good. That's yeah. Good. So no, I, don't, I don't even look at the. I very, very rarely look at how many thumbs up and thumbs down. So it's not even something which is on my consciousness, really. It's not something. Especially if you're leaving the. If you take the live videos down quickly thereafter, they're gone anyway. So. Yeah, that's all the videos. It's not just the live videos. You'll see that on all the videos. Every single video. You take them down for how long do you usually leave them up? The lives, I, if I, whenever I remember. If I forget to do it, then it stays up. But I just, the lives I take them down usually the same day, the next day. If I forget, they might stay there for a week or two. But uh, even the recorded videos, they all get thumbs down. Oh, I thought you were talking about taking the, the videos down. I was about to say... No, I just make them private. The lives, I make them private. The lives I don't leave on. But the recorded ones I leave on. And those, the... If I was really worried about it, I would just make... I would turn off the ability to thumbs up and down. You know, it just doesn't bother me. Not in the slightest. I find it humorous. So, what uh, have you been in the shop today? Yeah. Um, so, I revisited a pipe which I've been sitting on for quite a long time. Which I've not been able to understand why it hasn't sold yet. I started. I couldn't remember what the pipe number was, so I looked on my website to see what it was. It's not on the website. And I said, "What an idiot! No wonder it hasn't sold. It's not on the website." So that's that one. Anyway, so I re. Um, I restained it, I sanded it and restained so it. Serious. Did a very minor adjustment on the design. Hopefully that'll go. It's, it's a lovely piece. It's a beautiful piece of briar. I can understand why and it's not. <laughs> anyway. It's like, where are my glasses? <laughs> so, we'll see what happens with that one. And I'm in the middle of pipe uh, 473. I think the first video of yours I saw you may have been in the 90s, but for sure it was under 110. And it's just amazing. You, you crank about two out a week, don't you? Two or three a week? Five or six. Five or six. Wow. But I do at least one a day usually. Recently, sometimes I might take a couple of days, depending on the complexity of the pipe. But um, on average, I'll do one a day. So I do usually from Sunday to Thursday. I'll do one a day. Friday is a short day. Saturday is you know, day. So maybe Saturday night I'll do some, you know, um, but do something that's not part of me. But usually it's Sunday to Thursday. So on average, I would say four to five pipes a week. Wow. Yeah. So I know that uh, you've got a pretty good following in Israel. And one of my friends actually bought a pipe of yours that kind of went to a wrong address. Is that the one to a lot? Yeah, he okay. went to a lot and uh, couldn't find it. So he, you know, he's fl freaking out. He knows that I know you, and he's like, "Man, I don't, I don't understand what's going on." And I was like, first off, get in touch with the post office." And if it comes to find out, the post office, like, well, I don't know, somebody, somebody signed it, but who? But I had to find out, and it was delivered to a certain place. And in the end, the place that it got sent to, um, I had to be careful on like exactly what goes here but uh, <laughs> a person let's call it an office and there's a front desk secretary that uh, was there didn't understand it the label's kind of worn so they can't really understand what's going on and then they put a sticker over some contact information or whatever and they're like we don't know who this is or whatever so they said uh, instead of send it back to the post office it was open it up and see what it is and it just so happens that uh, one of the people that were standing there that was probably the person's boss was also a pipe smoker. I don't know. Hello. If, I don't know. I don't know. Christmas. If, exactly. It's Hanukkah. Exactly. Exactly. And so um, 
roundabout way, uh, a friend of mine that had bought the pipe knew somebody that still worked in that area and goes in there and asks, somebody has, has done whatever in this box, where is it at? It's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then it came out very quickly that, oh, so it was like, oh, no, don't send it back, you know, they'll destroy it, they'll do this, they'll do this. So, but it ended up, it took a little bit, but he ended up getting it, and uh, it's fantastic pipe. I think it's the first, like, seriously carved pipe that you ever did. It's the first in that idea, in that type yeah. of uh, type of pipe. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was a bit of a watershed moment in my freehand making of pipes. Um, he actually told me the story, um, and he said that, because um, basically he, he paid for it by PayPal, which mm -hmm. most people do, and I sent it to the PayPal address. Right, because I think PayPal sends you a, the address that's linked to the account. Right? Yeah, and that's not his. And he, he'd actually bought a pipe from me previously. Yeah, and I sent it to his correct address. But I, I, I can't remember every address, and I don't keep a whole sort of filing cabinet of addresses. So I do it based on each purchase. Exactly. And PayPal sent me the address. I sent it to that address. So uh, anyway, he went to that address, and I think he had to say to them, "I see you've got a CCTV camera. Let's have a look at the video." And that's how I think they ended up. Um, to fess up Could and, be. and give it to him. Could be. Which was, I, I think it was a bit sad, but at least he got it. And it was unsmoked. So that's that's that. the most important thing. Yeah. I, we were <laughs> laughing about it. He uh, he raises sheep, and so every now and then when I go over by his house, we've got several yeah, friends together that uh, smoke pipes, and he's uh, he's one of them. So. I didn't know uh, you were friends with him. It's cool to know. Yeah, yeah, very good friends, actually. We're very, very good friends. And so um, we'll go to his uh, place, like one of his barns or whatever that he's got, where he's got thousands of sheep and we go out there and have like a burn barrel and stuff and do barbecues and stuff and, uh we don't do barbecue, barbecue the land sheep? Oh, we, no, we no. don't barbecue <laughs> the land why not uh it's it's a long process to do well, we barbecue lamb we just don't barbecue his <laughs> lamb <laughs> so because it's a long process to uh to process an animal processing oh, it process, isn't yeah, it? yeah. so um, but it was it was really good we uh he, he loved the pipe very much and we were all kind of laughing about it about so a person who raises sheep technically is not allowed to consume his own animals no of course he is of course he is but you've got shita then you actually have to go through and process and break the animal down it's a lot of equipment there i don't know if you've ever done it when i was still in texas i uh worked with um, a big kosher meat production in out of Fort Worth. Not Rubushkin's. Not Rubushkin's. No, um, it wasn't. It was uh, Alley Meats, which is a big sockmer up in New York. But they did their processing in Texas at Frontier Meats. And so, you know, I was a paramedic and it just stopped working on the ambulance. And so, I was fascinated. I was learning Kulin, the second Kulin, at the time going through. And so, it was. I really enjoyed learning how to. I've seen some well. of the books about that sort of whole topic. Yeah. I find it quite gruesome. I couldn't read really. it. It's, you know, for me, looking through the book, I mean, you know, of course, I also went through gross anatomy when I was doing stuff. And it's it's also like I'm a little squeamish. But uh, I can do everything but work on the kill floor. Work on? The kill floor. Oh, right. Okay. Just, just couldn't do it. it to me, it was, it was just too much. But. Uh, is it, is it, I mean, have you seen it, though? Yeah. Is it, is it as gruesome as people say? I mean, is there a lot of screaming and screeching from the animals and stuff? No, not at all. None. Zero. As a matter of fact, that where I worked, they would come in. And first off, it's like a black tunnel. And there's a light at the end of the tunnel, ironically enough. <laughs> but it has, yeah, it has been almost enough. I notice whenever I meet up with somebody, time goes in a flash. It does, doesn't it? So what have you still got to do, Tory wise? So Sunday is the wife's day, and we're going to Harry Potter. <laughs> okay, well you're fitting. Exactly, and um, you know I've dragged her to every historic Anglo-Saxon archaeological site you can imagine around the area. So she's she's fine with them. I'm a trained tour guide, so naturally I like these things. I like prehistory and Stone Age and, and all this stuff. And um, so she is very long suffering in that and she deals with that. So and you have to do your first show. You know, but it's fine. I, I find it fun too. 
but uh, the first thing we planned and, and bought tickets for was Harry Potter. Cool. So uh, we'll do that. Where was that? Um, Universal Studios, which is kind of north east, I think, of uh, like, yeah, it, I think it's technically just outside of London. Okay. But um, I don't know if it's Hampstead, Hampstead Heath, Heath studio, maybe probably. somewhere around the Hampstead Heath area. Hampstead Heath is north west It's where I cannot from where I live. Yeah, so I don't think it's too far from there. Yeah, ironically enough, it's not we're Pinewood going Studios. Is it? Huh? It's not Pinewood Studios. I no, I don't think so. I mean, I'll look and see, but I don't, I don't think so. No, I'm not familiar, no. to be honest. No, I think there's, there's Pinewood. There's, is there Oak Street as well? I forget. Yeah, all I've got on here is just that. Yeah. Just that we're going here. So we actually catch the bus at Baker Street. And there's a private shuttle that takes you, that drives you there. Oh, okay, cool. And in the process, it's like an hour from, from Baker Street to get up there. They show the Harry Potter films on the bus. Oh, wow. Like, right, cool. so it's pretty fun. It's Original experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have to do the whole experience. And then... Um, I must be honest, I never really watched those films. I saw when the pandemic hit and the yeah. kids had to be occupied. So we had our sessions, our family sessions. And uh, so we did get a little bit oh. familiar with Harry Potter. And it was actually enjoyable. I enjoyed yeah, it. They're very entertaining movies. Yeah. I um, we only watched one to three. After that, some of my younger kids it's a little bit too heavy. Yeah. But um, I enjoyed it. Okay, so you have kids out the ears, and they range from adult to they range very from young. Uh, twenty nine to eight. Wow, that's uh, twenty nine. Just had his third child a couple of days ago. Wow. Uh, grandchild. I'm supposed to be going to this one. Yeah, Whilst did you, you decide here, if you're going to do it or not? So far, I'm not hungry. It's, it's, it's too expensive, and although travel is cheaper than it used to be, it's still, um, the whole thing, it's not just the ticket. You've got to pay the various taxes, you've got to pay the COVID test when you get there, and the travel, hotel, the food, it all comes to money, and it's just not the time for me to do that. So, I, I spoke to my son just uh, on, on the way here, and he called me while I was in the car. And he was asking me if I'm coming or not. He was hoping that I was, and I said, "Look, I've been for the other two, his first two kids, and um, I, I said I would like to, but it's not looking like it." So I said, "Fine." Yeah, I guess he kind of understands where about in Israel does he live? Jerusalem. What specific area of Jerusalem? Um, I think it's called Menachot Yitzchak. So it's in the like Gula, near, not too far. Okay, I was about to say it's got to be around Gula or maybe French Hill yeah, or something like there. that. Yeah, in okay. the hub hub. Well, We're in Katamon, right down the street from uh, First Station, which is uh, the old Turkish train station. I'm not familiar with this right now, I'll be honest with you. So if you have the old city, and I say this is the, the Western Wall. The Ula is Rich. kind of up this way. Rich. We're a 25, 30 minute walk from Jaffa Gate. Um, so this way, straight down the main drag. She is gifting him that. So that Last time I was there, I stayed in the Jerusalem Gate Hotel. It was very nice. Fairly basic, but very nice. Um, but it wasn't quite an area. It's walking distance, but not. Quite. Just to go from there to Gula was really a cab drive. Well, Robust yeah. Drive. I mean, listen, I would uh, offer for you to come and crash at our place. We have two dogs uh, and a, uh, a, a, a great, comfortable bed. And I'm not talking about just mine, I'm talking about a guest bed. And, um, you know, uh, you could do it, but it's it's in Catamount. It's a pretty good, pretty good schlep from, from there. I don't think you're going to be able to walk it. So. Oh, don't you have an issue with your with your ankle or your foot? It's been okay recently. Um, I I changed. Funnily enough, sometimes it's something simple. I don't know if it's that, but it's been okay since. So when I was in the workshop, I used to wear Crocs. The worst thing for your feet yeah. Yeah. on the planet. Yeah. yeah, tell me about it. So they're very nice and spongy and comfortable, but there's zero support. So your foot is all over the place. All the little bones in there are just mushed up. Um, and that's, I think, what all the problem was. I bought some Birkenstocks, you know, the, what the medical yeah. profession use, um, and it's been fine since. 
So I used to do the same thing when I worked on an ambulance. I had uh, boots that I wore, and any time that I would, wasn't in my boots, I would wear Crocs. And around the house, I'd wear That's Crocs. That's exactly right. I'm wearing boots now. And I wear the boots, and I used to wear Crocs around the house. And it, uh, they killed me. Yeah. My feet were killing me. I went to a podiatrist, and I went wow. to the podiatrist wearing Crocs. Oh and he said, I'm going to just give you a heads up now. Your issues with plantar fasciitis and all this other stuff are because of those. My wife has that plantar fasciitis, whatever you want to call it. Yep. Yes. So mine ended up being, it was plantar fasciitis, but it was also because of some other things, because I have a type of rheumatoid arthritis that it hadn't been diagnosed. And so I was having inflammation issues all over. And so, uh, so what profession, this, this is going to be a lot easier for me to ask you, what profession haven't you done rather than what you have done? And then, you know. Okay, so I'll kind of explain because a lot of people are just so like, man, you've things. done so many things, yeah. right? So I started working when I was 14 years old and I had only been 14 for three days. Right. Most people are 14 for 365 days. Right. So I had just turned 14 oh, right. okay. and I'd gotten a job. And so I actually interviewed for the job before I was 14. And they were like, Is that legal? Oh, it was legal at the time. I, I think you have to be 15 or 16 now. Well, it's, it is Texas after all. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, my grandmother, you know, she literally was a redneck, grew up on a farm that grew peanuts and cotton. And um, during harvest season, during school, she had to pick cotton, 100 pounds of cotton a day at eight. You know, she, she may not even weigh 100 pounds. But, uh, you know, and that's just kind of where I came from. And so I was always used to working as much as I could wherever I could. And so I've had a lot of different jobs. And I used to work as a paramedic. I worked 24 hours on, 48 hours off. What age did you start as a paramedic? In emergency medical services, which I got into it and then worked up to a paramedic, I was probably 25, maybe 25, probably a little earlier than that. So I was working in it and going to school. And um, I did it for. I mean, I volunteered for a couple of years before that. So I was probably 23, maybe, when I did it. And I worked in the industry for about 13, 15 years, somewhere around there. And during that time, in order to keep up with continuing education, I started working with American Heart Association as an instructor to teach CPR and all these other classes that you, you got to teach uh, to doctors and nurses and all this other stuff, right? And uh, we'd go around and show people how to use AEDs and, and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, automated external defibrillators okay. that uh, the little, yeah, paddles basically. So, which is interesting because those don't actually start the heart. They stop it. So reboot. So it's a reboot. It's a hard reset button on your computer. So what happens is that there's a specific electrical rhythm going on in the heart that is erratic. And it is kind of like feedback in a sound system where you want the music to happen. You don't hear the music because the feedback is taken over. And so you just zap it to reset it. And about 30 seconds in, you'll get a signal from the brain to the heart that says beat and then it'll restart again, hopefully, hopefully. So those 30 seconds, no oxygen, no well, work into the body. And that electrical right. rhythm that's going on, there's also no breathing or... That's what I'm saying, so no, what happens to the brain with no oxygen? Um, within about three to five minutes, it starts to swell up. And so I'm saying, cause, what I'm saying is, is that when that happens to somebody and they need to resuscitate them, or whatever, it, that 30 seconds or a minute is not harmful? So uh, it is harmful. And, and to, a lot of people are worried about when they do CPR, when they use an AED, it's like, oh, I'm going to hurt the person. And it's very important for the people to understand it. It's kind of stressful when you're doing CPR. The person's dead. So you're saving their life, right? They're not dying. They're dead. They have no pulse. They're not breathing. That's dead. Now, there's a short period of time, and especially if they have no pulse, it means there's no blood circulating. So when you're doing chest compressions, you're trying to get blood to circulate around. And so for many years, they would do five compressions and breathe twice and five compressions. And we realize now, if you witness somebody have a cardiac arrest and you instantly start doing chest compressions on them, you don't give them breaths. You just constantly do chest compressions. 
because there's enough oxygen on the hemoglobin of the blood to keep the brain and the kidneys and the heart so alive, right? So how long would that be, okay, before you start injecting oxygen, breathing in? You know? I've never seen anybody recover from having CPR done for more than probably eight to ten minutes. It's quite a long time. Unless, unless they're, they're very cold. Like if they're hypothermic, that, that protects them, right? And so that's something else that American Heart Association started doing too, was they started doing a hypothermic protocol. So certain ambulances or whatever, if there's a witness uh, cardiac arrest, they'll put a cold, they call it a cold blanket on them, and they'll bring the body temperature down into the 80s, and then they'll start to start doing it and it really helps but so obviously that works yeah so most of the time if you witness cardiac arrest and you start cpr instant almost instantly or very quickly and then you defibrillate them quickly yeah that is the best situation where somebody will come back and make it from that. anything more than about I want to say probably six minutes, and I only say six minutes because you do two minutes of CPR, then you recheck the pulse and the breathing, and then two minutes and recheck. I've seen people come back from three, and I've seen kids come back from five. So if somebody's in the middle of getting heart pumps, and the heart starts again, but you carry on, you don't know yet, and you're carrying on pumping. It does not injure the heart. It doesn't, it doesn't injure the heart. So it, it, it really, you know, guys, your size and my size, you know, we're big. And it's not just all fat. We're just, we're thick in general. So if you consider that the heart lies about midline in between, you know, that's that's that much. That's, that's four, six inches worth of stuff. Now, I can tell you now, you've got ribs here. And it's very hard to compress those to get to the point that it's going to do anything about it. But at that, all you're doing is squeezing it to try and get through there. And anything you do is far more beneficial. So when you when you compress, you're actually compressing the ribs, and the ribs is pushing down really on on that central area. So the sternum, which is right here, your heart doesn't sit directly under the sternum; it sits kind of over to the side, right? Yeah. So. And it actually, instead of sitting like this, it kind of sits like this. So when you start pushing on the on the chest, you're actually pushing on the bottom part of the heart. So you say you go between the nipples right here, and that's exactly where the lower part of the heart is, the ventricles that push blood out to the body. So when you're pushing down, they say if you can compress the chest that much, that's that's what you need to do. So they say one and a half to two inches. I'm a big guy. I'm a big guy. And when you see that uh, the standard is two minutes of CPR and then you switch chest compressors, I've been in the back of the ambulance and I've had to do CPR on my own for 15 minutes. And I was done. Yeah, and I was fit. I was fit. You must have been yeah, it was horrible. It was horrible. You got the guy back on him. Uh, he was down for a while when we got there, so, but so the, yeah, but the protocol allowed, uh, I never lost a patient on the ambulance, and anybody that I was able to, anybody, I can't say that it was me, anybody that spontaneously recirculated, is how we put it, um, under my care, was dropped off at the hospital, still under their own recirculation, okay? I've never lost anybody like that. However, I've had people that too far gone by the time you got to yeah, too far gone that when I got there. So there's there's some interesting. Uh, I'm just going to use the gents. So I've just finished up with Shimshon, uh, just walking around the corner to cigars. They, I just popped in there and had a look at the humidor. They've got an amazing selection of cigars. I'll have to come back um, another time. I mean, I've got more time to uh, talk to the guy. Um, but my parking is about to run out. But uh, very impressive. Uh, they've been there since January. Um, but uh, yeah, it should be interesting to pop in there. So this is the Havana Cigar Exchange. This used to be the Dunhill store. 
Um, they've revamped it, but it's essentially the same. The humidor is the same and the lounge area is the same. Just had a chat with Jonathan, the owner, and uh, hopefully at some point in the future, I'll have a, a little chat interview with him. He's, he said that would be good. So I'm really looking forward to that at some point in the future. But uh, for now, we will have to call it a day. We've got to get back to the car. Well, that's another fantastic, successful meeting with a YTPC member. Thoroughly enjoyed it. That's the weight of my bag on the passenger seat. What an amazing guy. Shimshon is such an amazing fellow, such a wide variety of experiences, life experiences. I could sit and chat with him for days, never mind hours. As always, time always flies. Uh, we sat for about an hour and a half, but it literally went like it was five minutes. And uh, as always with uh, YTPC members, you know, you just don't have that sort of stranger syndrome where you're meeting somebody for the first time and you got to kind of break the ice, get to know them, you know, get past that awkward, you know, kind of stage. You just don't have that in the YTPC. You know, you've interacted so many times. You know, with Shimshon especially, he's a, he's a member of the Pipe Club of London. So uh, during the pandemic, there's been the uh, virtual meetups that he's been on there. I've met him. He's been on my lives. And um, it's just great when you meet somebody face to face and then just carry on where you left off kind of thing. And uh, I've had that with every single YTPC member that I've met, I've had exactly the same situation. It's just like meeting somebody that you've known for years. Well, in some cases, that is actually the case, um, even if only virtually, but um, that is essentially the situation. Um, but very, very interesting fellow. And um, I caught some of it on camera, but we actually spoke for much longer than that on a variety of topics, totally unrelated to pipe smoking, um, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Very, very knowledgeable fellow. Really had an awesome time. Um, thanks very much, Shimshon, for coming to meet me. It was an absolute honor and a pleasure. And thanks for the tin of tobacco. I'm looking forward to trying that at some point. Uh, popped in also to Seagars. Um, the Seagars Limited website has been going for quite some time. Um, they're probably one of the first uh, online purveyors of, of Cuban cigars. You know, proper website, you know, merchandising website. Um, I'm not sure how long their website has been up, but uh, I was speaking very briefly to the to the guy in the store, and um, he says he thinks that they were the first. But I'll have to pop back and, and do a proper video there at some point. Um, I was in kind of short for time; I had to get back to the car. Um, on the way down to the car, I also popped into the Havana the Havana Cigar Exchange or whatever it's called, something like that. Uh, it used to be the Dunhill store. Um, which was British American Tobacco or BAT, um, but it was run as under the Dunhill name. Um, they went out, or well, they didn't renew their lease uh, about uh, when was it? March last year, possibly. Um, which was sad because I really loved going to that store um, and sitting down in the lounge there. But they haven't changed it that much. Just uh, spruced it up a little bit, but the lounge is still the same. Just new furniture, but. Um, anyway, I had a chat with Jonathan, who's the owner of the store, and I told him I'd love to come back and possibly interview him, do a proper video, and he said, yeah, that would be lovely. So I'm really looking forward to doing that at some point. Um, he's got a fantastic range of cigars. Um, the Cigars store also has a very good range of cigars, especially aged cigars. They've got some really, uh, you know, cigars which are quite old. They have some 2004 um, Cohibas, um, okay, you're talking about very, very expensive cigars, but if you're in that kind of bracket, then to be able to pick up a, 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 an almost 20 year old limited edition cigar, fantastic. It's, it's fantastic to have that possibility if you're in that kind of market. Um, and uh, the, the Havana Exchange Cigar Exchange also had a, a good range of cigars. I, he had a Bahike there, I saw, um, which you don't see that often in, in, in cigar shops. So I must say that uh, it's really good to see uh, cigar shops popping up and having a really good, well-stocked, with a diverse range of cigars. So I haven't been here, you know, 
regularly now for a long time uh, since the pandemic started really whereas I used to come maybe once or twice a month at least once a month you know if I came to the Pipe Club of London meetup um, but uh, sometimes it would be more than a month depending if I was doing any work in, in near to the centre of London but since the pandemic I think I've only been here uh, once which was today was the second time the first time being when I went to meet um, Jack the Piper Giuliano so um, I hope that I'll, I'll be able to take some time out and uh, I'm, I'm very much home based these days you know doing the pipe making um, so I don't get out and about that much but I'd have to make the time make the effort to, to pop in and, and uh, do proper videos of these uh, really very nice uh, cigar shops anyway I think that's me for now uh, it's taking me around this back route here I think this is the uh, Soho area back here somewhere you eventually get to Covent Gardens. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed that. At least the modicum as much as I did. I wish you well, have a great day, and I'll catch you on the next one.